Thank you. I want to thank Brad for putting this panel together. Thank you for uh, allowing uh, me to participate with the Ohio State crew. You, I mean, it's incredible. Actually, um, the number of great trainees that you have that are worthy of this podium is really impressive and, and such. So, uh, so my disclosures uh, are Gore Medical and Medtronic in the hernia world, and they will not apply to uh, today's talk. So. Post-op one, the tach tachycardia is the topic that we'll uh, discuss for about the next 10 minutes. And when you look at the reasons and rationale for that, it kind of falls into a, a SERS response with our patients, potentially bleeding, uh, leak, PE, and then things that fall into everything else. And so what I wanted to do is at least start with the answer to the question, uh, which is what do you do with post-op one, day tachycardia, is think about this and keep this in mind. Early reoperation means early discharge. And so uh, oftentimes when our patients have major issues that happen early, the earlier we figure it out and operate and fix it, the more likely they are going to go home with uh, a relatively reasonable discharge uh, duration and uh, less complications. So uh, I want to start with my data. Um, we just uh, went through our recertification through the MIPS equip, and so all this data has been reviewed and uh, had our on-site reviewer. And if you haven't looked at your SAR data, it's a great place to start. It is, as we talked about with the earlier, is we have our own patterns of complications. And so here's my pattern, um, at least at our institution with my partners. And so this is looking at gastric bypass patients in a year's time. And you know the SAR data, you get uh, semi-annual reports, but that are annual. Uh, and so over this time period, and I believe this is the uh, 2018 data, is that we did about 131 laparoscopic gastric bypasses and had four serious events. And this doesn't project very well up there, but essentially with four events, we are uh, performing as expected uh, and are in the uh, second category, uh, at least se second decile um, with regards to performance. But when you go down to the next one, you see that there's a leak. We had one leak in this category. Um, we had two bleeds, and we had a, a negative X lap, which was uh, part of our reoperation. And so, uh, but if you look at that one leak, um, and that leak rate is uh, less than one percent, that puts you in the ninth decile amongst your peers. Uh, and so, it can be quite frustrating to think about one particular patient or one thing that doesn't go right. And I think that there is an important psychology that we remember is that we are taking care of patients, and we are not taking care of databases. Um, and doing the right thing for the patient is the most important thing and how things shake out over time. And we, as they were reported and we are compared to ourselves and others, uh, we need to make sure patients come first. So that's kind of uh, something to look at. If you look, what, when, uh, with regards to serious events, um, we have done an amazing job as a, a bariatric community driving down over the last 15 years, serious complication, leak rates, bleeding rates, reoperation rates, really by a logarithmic scale. Uh, thinking about a 2% leak rate being commonly reported ten, 10 years ago, those are now being quoted as 0.2%. And that's really what's borne out in the data, is that leak rates are about 0.3 to 3%. But if you look at really how tight uh, the, uh, the graphics are, if you dig deeper into your SAR data, you'll see how narrow it is to be in the, in the uh, middle uh, or top quartile, is, is, is those are very small numbers. And so post-op one tachycardia with regards to uh, the complications such as bleeding, PE, and leak are extremely rare, uh, but they are very important things to, to, for us to figure out. So I began with a question and I, and, and I just uh, asked myself, how frequent is tachycardia in our patients who have gastric bypass surgery? And so uh, Rob Rosenthal has a very nice, uh, easy study with his uh, fellow. It was published over 10 years ago. I don't know if, if, if Rob was in the audience, but a very nice thing of just documenting how frequent tachycardia is found in our patients in, in the postoperative period. And in 153 patients in one year in his program, he found that 102 patients had documented tachycardia uh, on the rhythm strips in the postoperative period, which is 66% of our patients. And clearly there's a huge gap between 66 and 0.2 or 0.5 or even 1% who are gonna have things that need reoperation. What I think he did a nice thing is, is looking at is that, uh, of course, he had no leaks or PEs in his program, but bleeding was the, the main operation or main reason for his reoperations. But most of the patients who have tachycardia, based on this uh, outlook, have either a SERS response uh, or they have a medication 
uh, change or they have a medication withdrawal, but all that is only figured out as you evaluate your patient. And so the takeaway is, is that even though the tachycardia may be transient, the tachycardia may be, um, uh, may be short term, but uh, tachycardia needs to be, to be looked at uh, really because the time interval for you to intervene is beginning to, uh, to tick away. So I'll present here a, a bit of my case. Uh, this is my leak that I reported to the SAR database. Um, this is a little distractor for you to be able to see what bleeding is, and all of you know what bleeding looks like interoperatively, so I'll just move on to the case presentation here. So this is a 44-year-old female, BMI 40, uh, started out in the program with a BMI 45, who had diabetes, hypertension, GERD, undergoes a gastric bypass, um, had a, a hernia from a previous operation, which caused us to do a little bit of uh, uh, work, but, um, but anyways, uh, the morning report from the, the team is that they had a documented episode of orthostatic hypotension while they were getting up to the bathroom, and the team said, she looks great, it, it's transient, it must have been a vagal response, so things are just fine. Uh, you go and see the patient, that was me, I went and saw the patient on the floor, they're sitting there in the bed, they look well, they feel well, a little lightheaded, some palpitations when she stands or walks. And then we explain that we're going to watch your crit and see where it goes. So here's her vital signs as they are throughout the day. And the truth is, is that she had two episodes of orthostatic hypotension uh, that are documented very well here with severe tachycardia up into the 130s. That resolved with fluid. Uh, but her hematocrit similarly went down from preoperatively th uh, 13 to 10, which is the first postoperative uh, one. And then the one in the morning drops down to a hemoglobin of... Uh, of eight, and so we have our answer. Um, the question now is, is that do you operate on the patient or do you observe the patient? Do you give them a transfusion? Do you uh, hydrate them further? Do you make plans for the operating room? Uh, my uh, management of these types of patients that have clear recurrent uh, orthostasis related to bleeding is to reoperate on them. So I took her back on post-op day number one uh, and uh, return to the operating room when you find that four units of blood sitting there in the lesser sac and you find that staple line bleed that wasn't bleeding at the time when you left. Um, you control that with over sewing with the suture, uh, irrigate the patient out. Uh, patient went to the ICU overnight for one night, transferred to the floor on post up day number two, and then DC'd home post up day number three. And so just an example of uh, uh, aggressive um, management of these patients often uh, gets them back on the path towards ERAS. Uh, leaks, um, these are uh, what we spent a lot of time thinking about. We had a lot of talk today with regards to how the different techniques and how to optimize your pouch. Uh, my patient was a 43-year-old uh, female. Um, that was the bleeding episode, but the leak episode was, uh, was a heavy lady, a BMI of 70 when she started the program. We got her BMI down to 63. She had diabetes, hypertension, and GERD. She was doing very well with her preoperative weight loss. Took her to surgery, she had a hiatal hernia, which we found at the time. Uh, did a mobilization of the hiatus and fat pad and uh, the operation went relatively well. Uh, Post-op day number one, tachycardia, responsive to fluid challenge, which it always seems to be in our, in our hands. And then post-op day number two, we have an increase in leukocytosis, worsening tachycardia, and then the fever curve begins to rise. Um, so here's the uh, pulse rate for her, They're much different than our uh, orthostatic hypotensive patient. Uh, the leak patient here is just a kind of an elevated rise, gets a fluid challenge, the, uh, the uh, pulse goes down and then it, it goes back up. If you also look at her temperature curve here, she has a little bit of a spike on, on day one, but a clear spike on day two, and you kind of know what's going on here. Uh, this, this fever curve happened uh, the, at midnight, you'll see, on the second, uh, on the post-op day number one. And so the night team orders a CT scan. They're not really thinking too much. They think that she has poor pulmonary toilet. She's got uh, lactosis is the main cause of this. She's drinking well. And so they get a CT PE protocol. If you can go ahead and play the, play the CT here. Let's see if I got that. There you go. Thanks. So this will just play through, and you'll notice there are a couple of air bubbles that begin to pop up here and here, and we track them down. There's one there, and then there's one sitting right here outside the pouch, right there. And so uh, not a lot of fluid, not a lot of air. You can talk yourself out of this and say, well, maybe this is just uh, CO2 that hasn't resolved, maybe a little air from our... Uh, on the table endoscopy is there as a, as a reservoir, but her clinical picture was fitting 
a different pattern. It fit leak in my mind. And so, what does uh, what does it what does the CT scan say? Uh, the CT reads bilateral low bar atelectasis and non-occlusive pulmonary emboli, no findings of heart strain, bilateral dependent atelectasis, status post root and wide gastric bypass, no unsuspected post-op findings. So my resident calls me about four o'clock in the morning and says, great news, it looks like it's a non-occlusive PE, we're gonna anticoagulate, patient's doing well. And um, I came in to look at the scan and I had a different view of this scan um, and I felt the patient had a leak and so I had them uh, take her to the operating room that morning took her back, uh, found that classic uh, fluid in the uh, abdomen, returned to OR for what I presumed was a leak. Um, we found a gastric, pa uh, gastric pouch perforation. It was at the GE junction. Never seen that before. Uh, this was during the mobilization of the fat pad and probably is a thermal injury that I created with my energy source. Um, but at, we're here post-op day number two, so I perform a primary suture repair. Um, I used that fat pad as a plication over the top. We did an on the, ta on the table EGD leak test, a place to drain. Uh, went to the IC overnight, uh, went to the floor on post op day number four, and DC at home on post op day number five. So, high, sus high, high suspicions of index, uh, and so that's what leak. The thing that I've learned about PE is that PE is rarely caused by, uh, uh, tachycardia is rarely associated with PE, which is kind of interesting. Um, tachycardia is uncommon clinical sign. If you look at the symptoms of PE, it's dyspnea, it's pleuritic chest pain, and it's tachypnea. Only 30% of patients have tachycardia that's associated with the PE. So we talk about PE a lot. And to kind of finish up on this topic, PE very rarely presents in the first five days. This is a nice data out of uh, the Mayo Clinic looking at the, the time course between gastric bypass and uh, incidents of either VTE or of PE. And the earliest that was documented was post-op day number four in a young patient. And they actually risk stratify based on age. So your younger patients typically will have it earlier, but rarely in the first 24 to 48 hours. So tachycardia in your patient is most likely gonna be transient, could be medications that are, are SERS response. It sh those should be excluded as you work through the patient. Consider leak and bleed, and PE is gonna be quite low in our patient population. But early reoperation on those patients that have bleeding and leaks can lead to early discharge. Thank you. <laughs>